Hello there and welcome to my County 1120 discussion on corporations. My goal for this first discussion is to talk about the characteristics of corps. Give you a little feel for how they come into existence and some of the rules that govern them. First of all, they're interesting creatures. Corporations are a separate legal entity. By saying that, that's saying that they can enter into contracts, they can sue, and they can be sued. They actually exist in the state that they're brought into being in. Corporations can have a large number of owners they can have as many owners in theory as they can issue stock for. They're a popular form of business because there's no legal liability of the owners. The corporation fails. It's responsible for itself and owners who have purchased the stock are not responsible for paying the corporate debt. This is one of the things make it very popular. Another thing that makes it very popular is it has an unlimited life. Sole proprietor ends when the sole proprietor is no more and partnerships end whenever a partner comes and goes. But corporations have an indefinite life. Can buy and sell stock on the stock exchanges or pass it between private owners as so many times as you want, and it doesn't affect the existence of the corporation. Corporations attract a large amount of capital because they can now tap into, say they have 1,000 people or 10,000 people interested in buying some stock. They can get money from all of them. They're not limited to the resources of a sole proprietor or a partner. One of the not so great things about corporations is since they're a separate legal entity, they have to pay income taxes, just like you and I. We really end up having double taxation because the corporation pays tax on their income, and then when they pay out a dividend, the dividend is taxed too. It's taxed by whoever receives it on their 1120 tax returns, so corporate income really is taxed twice. Another thing that's not as great about them is they have to file more regulations, more regulations for them to follow than there are for sole proprietors who have really none, and partners, corporations must meet and keep minutes. If you're going to be a corporation, you have to act like a corporation. And one more thing about them is their startup costs are a little higher. They're a little more complicated to get up and off the ground, where sole proprietors just take off running. They just need a business license and partnerships, although they should fill out a partnership agreement. Don't have the same hoops to jump to that a corporation does. Consider this. A corporation begins by filing um, what is called a certificate of formation in a state where they want a domicile. So they have a state of residence. And then the state, that's the first thing that happens, and then the state will issue a charter to the corporation. It's called a corporate charter. And the corporate charter lists in it many things, but some of the most important things that we'll be interested in is information that relates to common and preferred stock that they're going to issue in the future. Corporation then has to fill out bylaws. The rules under which they'll operate. And that really becomes a matter of their state. Corporate law is governed by states, and so there isn't a national law that deals with it. So you really have to, if you're going to be an attorney or a CPA, 
feels a lot in stock you have to have a state where you're specially have it as a specialty a corporate charter let's go back to that charter thing the charter thing is interesting to us in accounting because it identifies some things in it that affect how we do the accounting for a corporation for example it identifies the type of stock that the corporation can issue. Maybe they're going to issue common stock. And maybe we have to have common stock, so everyone has to have this. But you can also have preferred stock. That's optional. You might have a par value attached to your stock. Par value is kind of a nebulous thing. The corporation decides what par value will be. It's completely arbitrary. It has no relation to the market value of the stock. It's just a number that the state comes up with and says what it will be. They usually make it a small number because they don't want to issue their shares under that value. So among some of the other things uh, Charter identifies is the amount of shares that are authorized. How many shares of stock can this corporation issue? And that can be changed. You can um, modify your corporate charter just the money and an attorney and so though it's not completely binding um, it is a good place to start. One thing that you have to do with the authorized number of shares you can issue is actually list that on the face of the balance sheet. You'll see me do that as we make our way through this. Particularly interesting to us is the capital stock, both common stock and preferred stock. Stock owners have rights, and that's why they buy this stock. They have rights to vote for the board of directors. The board of directors then decides who's going to be the corporate officers. They have rights to participate in dividends. Whenever a dividend is declared, someone who owns the stock gets a right to it. They have rights to participate in receiving assets. When the corporation liquidates, if there are any left, and they also have an important right. It's called the preemptive right, and the preemptive right means you're allowed to keep your ownership intact. If you own 10% of the stock of a corporation, and they issue some new stock, you have a right to the first 10% or the right, first right of refusal to that, if you would like it. All of these rights accrue to common stock. They have all of these rights, but not all of them necessarily accrue to preferred stock, which is kind of interesting because it sounds like you'd have more rights, but preferred stock doesn't get to vote and who's going to be elected for the board of directors. And so it's a good trick to issue some preferred stock instead of common stock if you want to keep close control on your corporation. But preferred stock does have the right to receive dividends ahead of common stockholders. And when we look at dividends, Guess we should write ahead, huh? The common stockholders. You'll see that when we do some discussions on dividends. All of this will make more sense as we progress through. Some of the other things that the charter identifies is the par value of stock. How much the stock is going to sell for or not how much the stock is going to sell for, but how much 
it's going to say on the face it's par value. It definitely isn't how much it's going to sell for. Par value is an interesting and again a nebulous thing. It's an amount assigned by the state. It's listed on it. It's used heavily in an accounting, but it doesn't have anything to do. Nothing to do with the fair market value of the stock. It just helps us do the accounting for it. It does make a difference in order of liquidation, so we keep track of par value, keep track of all common stockholders' equity in quite a bit of detail. Some corporate charters allow for no par stock. It simplifies the accounting for it. Some corporate charters allow for no par stock and then states assign a stated value to the no par stock, which in a sense starts acting like par value. Oh, this sounds confusing. It is. But I think that once we get going on it, we'll see. It's not as bad as it sounds. We just need to practice. So, one thing that does happen of significance when you switch to corporations and sole proprietors and from partnerships is the balance sheet changes. We're now going to have Assets equal liabilities plus it's no longer owner's equity and it's no longer partner's equity. It's now stockholder's equity. Probably a more familiar term to you. Stockholder's equity has two distinct parts to it. One is called paid in capital and in this section of the stockholders equity we show the amount paid in by owners common stock preferred stock amounts for par and amounts paid over par so this section is called paid in capital and the name tells you what it is it's what you've received the second big section if the stockholder's equity is retained earnings. Now we're going to have to do a bit of work on retained earnings, but it's kind of a simple concept. Those are the earnings that a corporation, it's a net income, they get to keep, but they have not paid out in dividends. So those are the two broad sections, stockholder's equity. So retained earnings then is in a place, I'd like to do a comparison here. So these are the two big sections in stockholder's equity. Coming back now from that phone call, I want to do a little comparison here. of a sole proprietor where we have a capital account and a corporation where we have a retained earnings account. I'm going to do this several times with you because I really want you to get this idea. In a, corp in a sole proprietorship, everything goes into their capital account. Investments they make get put in there and draws that they take out get taken out. Net income that they made during the period gets closed into it. And retained earnings, any money paid in by owners gets put in the paid in capital section above. But what about the closing entries? You still have to close out net income. Net income is closed into retained earnings. And corporations don't give owners draws, but they do pay dividends to stockholders. 
So if you've been in business one year, you would have closed your net income and dividends into retained earnings. Let's say you went into business in 2014. Then in 2015, you would have closed your net income in there and closed your dividends in there as well. And in 2016, the same story. So for as long as you've been in business, any net income that you've made minus any dividends that you've paid lives in the balance of retained earnings. We still have to do closing entries and you need some of where to close them into. We just lost capital accounts when we moved into corporations. And so, here's a little comparison of how it's changed. More about that as we continue. That's enough for now. Thanks for joining me in the characteristics of corporations.